Now, when did you arrive in Vietnam? May of, May of 69. Okay. And then did you stay a full year there or longer? I stayed a full year. At the end of the year, they were going to send me back to a training base. I took one look at the orders and went up to the personnel officer at group headquarters. And at that time, back up, mm -hmm. Vietnam was not a declared war. Mm -hmm. So unlike World War II, once you're there, they, don't, they can't just keep you there. Right. It was a hardship tour. And a hardship tour, they can only keep you in there for one year. At that time, they were having trouble keeping enough pilots, and they were in the Vietnamization program where they were slowing down the war and trying to turn it over to the Vietnamese. So they had cut back the number of troops they were making back in the States. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have enough pilots for Vietnam. They had too many of them in the States. So if you extended six months to stay over in Vietnam, you could get another 30-day leave and a free R&R. And I was going to do the same thing in another six months. And then I'd have one year left, and they'd be sending me back to the States, and, oh, I'd have an attitude. <laughs> so I went up there, and I requested to put in the extension. And then the warrant officer came down one day, and he says, you believe in WOPA? And that's Warrant Officer Protective Association. And I said, yeah. Let me sit on your orders. There's something in the wind. He says, you're no lifer. I said, get out of here. He says, well, there's something. I, I just want to check out. And he come back, and he put the papers on the desk, and he says, this is for your six-month extension. He says, how'd you like to get out of service early? I says, how early? He says, well, do another six months. I says, you mean after this six months? He says, no, no. He says, do this six months, you get out a year and a half early. I said, what do I have to do? He says, just stay here. Do I still get my 30-day leave? Yeah. Do I still get my R&R? &R? Yeah. Can the president read it without his glasses? <laughs> you know, I'm signing that baby. So I then, instead of serving three years after flight school, I served a year and a half, and it was a year and a half straight in Vietnam, which they couldn't make you do. Mm -hmm. But I knew the unit, and it was, it was pretty good compared to most jobs over there. I wasn't taking potluck. And I was cutting six months off staying there and an extra year in the service. And all right. So you basically finished in Vietnam toward the end of 1970? December 23rd. Right. Okay. I'm going to go back now. Now, um, when you, you officially served with several different units in Vietnam. Which okay. is interesting because a lot of times when they do that, it's just a paperwork shuffle. Mm -hmm. You may not even change barracks. In my case, I did. But I didn't leave the artillery hill I was on. I didn't change the people I was working with. My job didn't change in any way, description, or form. But when I first got there, I was assigned a third of the 6th Artillery, which was an interesting unit because they had guns that we no longer had. They had SP-105s, uh, self-propelled mm -hmm. 105s, which looked like a small tank. Yep. Um, and they used them a lot for what we call hip shoots. They'd take them down the road, and they get to a place, and they just pull off the side of the highway, circle the guns, and they'd have an armed personnel carrier with them, which would be their forward direction center, FD, FDC. And they'd throw barbed wire out that they were carrying on the tanks. They'd throw barbed wire out around them, and they'd sit there, and that would kind of keep the enemy on, a, I don't know, a razor's edge. You'd have to kind of put a dot in the, a pin in the map and a string and draw a circle and say, now what can they cover they couldn't cover before? What are they going to be doing? Why are they doing this? And um, those units used to pull a lot of hip shoots. Okay. Now, as a helicopter pilot, did you work with them in some way? Oh, yeah. Our unit was different. I was talking to a friend of mine, and, and he was artillery, too. In his artillery unit, some of his pilots were directly de dedicated to like um, the intelligence officer. Mm -hmm. And that's all he flew for and that's all he did. And um, Our unit prior to us getting there it had bird dogs, L-19 fixed wings. And when we got there, they're still allocated the same way. There were four helicopters assigned to group, two to each battalion. Uh, they were allowed a pilot for each aircraft, a mechanic for each aircraft, and a toolbox. Mm -hmm. That was it. 
group put them all together and decided they had an aviation company that was to support everybody. Mm -hmm. And we did everything from flying the commanders to flying, well, I wrote my mom and told her I was flying uh, ice cream, mail, chaplains, ash and trash. I did, but we also did convoy cover. If we were there, we did the, res we did the um, medevacs. We did emergency resupply. Um, guns had to be repaired or somebody had to be brought back for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. We went out and got them. Um, if a unit was under attack and stayed that way long enough, or we happened to just be in the area, we'd fly overhead and sometimes we could see what's going on. We'd redirect artillery or move troops or mm -hmm. okay. whatever had to be done. I mean, we were basically just an airborne three-quarter ton truck and used for anything and everything. Okay, and what type of, hel of helicopter did you normally fly? Well, when I first got there, believe it or not, I was flying an OH-23 which was what you see, similar to what you see on MASH. Yeah, with a big bubble where yep. the pilot is. Yeah, It has right. a piston air engine. Um, 23 is different than 13, though. 13 pilot rides on one side, observer rides on the other. 23 pilot rides in the middle, straddling the console. A person can ride on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, later, I flew an OH-58, uh, which is a Bell Ranger, similar to what you see a number of news media people using. Mm -hmm. I was checked out and trained to fly a Huey, and the OH-58s were brand new. We had 13 of the 20 of them that came to Vietnam, and the Bell check rep lived with us. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, because self-centering bearings didn't, self-lubricating <laughs> bearings didn't, all kinds of things that the aircraft was supposed to be capable of doing and so on and so forth didn't happen. So these things were under close scrutiny. So from time to time, we'd get a Twix uh, radio teletype message that all our fleet was grounded. And pilots being pilots, we like to fly. I mean, we don't like combat, but we like to fly. So we'd go over then and fly with the, the, the lift units and stuff because, well, we were checked out to fly mm -hmm. them. And so then we'd go fly Hueys. Um, our group did um, requisition from up above somewhere, um, at least one Huey a day. And we normally got at least one lift aircraft a day. Sometimes we got two or three of them, and those were normally Chinooks mm -hmm. or cranes because we had some bases that were totally inaccessible by ground, and everything had to go in by air. I mean, we not only took in food, we took in water tanks, um, all their ammunition, mm -hmm. anything and everything. Yeah, and artillery ammunition, if you're taking that in, is, <laughs> is pretty substantial. Yeah. You can't um, take that in with a Huey. What most people don't realize is that while artillery is heavy, they quite often go through more their weight in ammo each day than what the gun weighs. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. so that's sort of, and, and so essentially that's the kind of work that you were doing throughout that year and a half. Now, 